I'm Kim Singletary. And I'm Rich Collins with Biz New Orleans Magazine. Welcome to Biz Talks. Each week, we reach beyond the pages of Biz New Orleans Magazine to bring you in-depth conversations with members of the business community. From the names everyone knows to the ones destined to make their mark, we'll dive into the top issues, best practices, successes, and failures of every industry that calls Southeast Louisiana home. Our guest on today's podcast is Amy Boyle Collins, the new Chief Executive Officer at Gamble Communications, a public relations firm that works with many New Orleans businesses. We're going to talk about how the pandemic has changed the jobs of PR professionals and also the COVID-related challenges facing Gamble's various clients. So welcome to the program, Amy. And to start, how has the state of PR in New Orleans changed? You know, Rich, I think the pandemic has fundamentally changed our world um, in the short term, and obviously it's going to likely lead to significant long-term changes. Um, One of the short-term changes, of course, is that we're all separated and we're working from home. Um, And at Gamble, it's the same as everybody. Our office is available to employees um, just because we have a standalone um, location in Metairie. Uh, But, you know, people are mostly staying home, which is what the government officials and the health experts are telling us. Um, So, you know, while it's provided flexibility, um, working remote has also led to some challenges, I think. Uh, So, you know, you have people balancing family challenges, you have isolation, uncertainty about the future. And so we've really worked hard to protect our own culture at Gamble. We're so team oriented. Um, So I think that's one thing that we're working through, right? And that we're being very purposeful and intentional. So we have team huddles twice a week. They were three times a week. Um, We've kind of gone down the two now. We have tried to get together socially distanced outside. Um, We actually had a little gathering at City Park where we all brought our festival chairs and our masks and sat around and visited. It was great to just have that contact. Um, But in terms of the PR industry, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is so much of what we do is based on large gatherings. So, you know, whether it's a special event, sponsor activations, press conferences, donor events, all of these things have had to sort of be redefined and refocused in this new world that we're living in. And so we've had to get creative. We've had to adapt new skills. So now we're doing telepressors via Zoom. We um, are having events that give people levels of interaction to their comfort. So for example, um, the local Beignet Fest has um, adapted or adapted this past couple weekends ago where you could get to go at restaurant locations or you could dine in. They were all featuring beignet specials. So instead of having the annual festival, we kind of spread it out And you could get the nostalgia of tasting beignets and having a festival experience. No music, of course, unfortunately. But um, it gave people a different different levels of engagement, which is really what we're talking about, right? Like we've had to build new ways to engage stakeholders for various clients. Um, And I think that's the number one way that PR has changed um, during the pandemic. Are people coming to you and asking for PR help as they were before the pandemic or has work slowed? How is what people are trying to do change too? Yeah, I mean, like everything, when there was the shutdown in March, I mean, it was scary, right? Like restaurants are shuttered, you know, hotels are shuttered. About 20% of our business is in food, beverage, hospitality uh, in New Orleans. That's our whole economy, right? Uh, not our whole economy, but a major facet. So we had to quickly adjust and those clients had to adjust. But then at the same time, you know, a few weeks goes on and maybe you're not doing that work right now, but then new things are coming out um, and new needs are arising with clients we've never worked with before um, or clients where we work with them, but in a different way. So for example, Um, with retirement communities, right? Like all of a sudden there was a shift in how those, we went from selling retirement communities to helping them communicate how can their loved ones still engage with the folks that are living there? What safety precautions are they taking? 
Uh, we happen to do a lot of crisis communication and issue management. It's not the fun stuff that we put all over our website to promote our business because we really can't talk about it. But we do a lot of that work and it's good work because it's always for people who need help navigating something, you know, and I did a crisis training certificate not too long ago. Um, and I learned one of the coolest things I learned, I think, in approaching a crisis is the word crisis comes from the Greek for a turning point where you make decisions. So when you think about it in that fashion and not in a panicked fashion, you start to really look at, I'm a glass half full kind of girl. So you start to really look at what are the choices I can make or what are the choices I can help my client make to do well, communicate well, and stay in business, quite frankly, a lot of times. So we have seen a shift. Uh, we're not doing ribbon cuttings as much anymore or you know, fun promotions necessarily right now, although we're trying to stay optimistic and do things that still make people happy. Um, a lot of the work we're doing right now is more the issue management, crisis work, um, advocacy for so many programs and people that need help. We do a lot of work in early childhood education across the state. Um, and so we're trying to tell that story about the need for quality early childhood care um, and what those daycare centers and early ed centers are going through right now. Um, and so that work is critically important. Um, certainly we do work for the New Orleans Women and Children's Shelter their needs are changing and increasing and evolving. Um, and so we're trying to support them in the best way we can. So we do a lot of nonprofit work and we've tried to really um, pivot and shift so that we can help people where they are. Yeah, it sounds like because you work with so many different types of businesses and industries and nonprofits, you have a sense for what's happening uh, in the big picture. You know, and so you mentioned early childhood and you're telling that story. What is the story they're trying to tell right now? So the need has never gone away, right? So quality early child care is still a need in our community. However, it has to be delivered differently because of social distancing. and be, But then also the centers are under economic strain. So they need the investment. And, and the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children has come a long way in advocating for government assistance for these child care centers and the families who utilize them. And um, there was a hallmark investment the state was going to make pre-COVID this year in those centers. And so we're just trying to make sure that that doesn't go away um, and that they continue, you know, because there are a lot of child care centers that may not make it. Um, and there are child care centers that need to deliver service differently for shift workers, right? So they need 24 hour hours, not just nine to five. And so all of those things are important and that we continue to work with our legislators that they understand that this is continues to be an important issue. So that's one of the messages. And then you certainly have just the baseline safety messages of where can you bring your children we are going to advocate for safety of our, our workers on the front line and daycare centers and all of those things. So we're trying to be a support system and, and really work as an extension of the team for the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. And also we work in Jefferson Parish in this manner specifically with Jefferson Ready Start, who's done some impressive work. So our work has shifted. Um, and it's definitely, we use that P pivot word so much now, <laughs> we're probably all going to be sick of it, right? <laughs> Sooner or later, but it really, everybody is having to make decisions at a turning point. Do you guys work with K through 12 type schools at all? And are you involved in any of the messaging related to all the anguish about what's going to happen this fall? We do work with some charter schools in Orleans Parish. Um, one of the things that I have seen that I really like in the past, because New Orleans is an all charter system, the district has struggled to unify policies that would help if all the charter schools came together. For example, bus transportation or um, cafeteria food, you know, and those sort of things. And so insurance is another one. And so whereas the district has struggled in the past with those things to bring everybody together, they've done a really outstanding job, as far as I can see um, through our work, of bringing all of the charter management organizations and independent charter schools together 
to look at guidelines um, and safety precautions for opening for our children. And I've really been impressed with that from NOLA Public Schools. We're not doing that work, so I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just, you know, observing as a communications professional something that I see that is working in our community right now. And, um, you know, it's all being advised by the city, um, Dr. Avegno, and, uh, and it's all based on science. Uh, she wants to see, as I've heard, uh, the um, infection rate at a certain percentage over time. And, um, you know, it just, it gives me, I'm a parent too of an Orleans Parish public school with two students. And so it gives me uh, quite a bit of confidence that they're not letting the politics uh, get away from them um, and make it a political decision, but really work and focus on the science and communicate that to, to parents. Our school has done a remarkable job of that. So now I'm just talking as a mom and not necessarily um, as a as a PR professional. Right. And I should mention that we're having this conversation a few days before this podcast is airing. So probably a lot of the schools um, on the date that uh, you, you folks are listening to this podcast, schools are a little further along in their plans than they are when we're talking about it. But uh, yeah, hey, right. so, so you mentioned that food and beverage represented about 20% of what Gamble does. Are you able to break it down for me by sector? Like, what's y'all's bread and butter besides food and beverage? Who, who are your other clients? Yeah, we do a ton in the nonprofit space, um, and we work for large nonprofits, small nonprofits. We work on projects, and we work on ongoing campaigns. Uh, we support some of our nonprofits in their fundraising, and then others we are simply supporting their programmatic communication, you know, making sure that people who they serve get the word out. Uh, and so we do a ton in that space. It's probably half of our business, if, a, if not more. And, and so, you know, again, what happened when we all shut down is there were some nonprofits who immediately said, you're a luxury, you know, we, we hope to, you know, talk to you in the fourth quarter, but we've got to go down the bare bones. And there were other nonprofits who said, we need you more than ever. It's very interesting. And of course, they're the ones who have a little bit more of a, a financial, you know, uh, budget to to help and to um, pay for our services. So we we did something that I think is important for all business is without a whole lot of uh, certainty, we helped where we could, you know, and, and sometimes that meant we're probably not going to get paid for this. But to the certain extent we can extend ourselves and help you, we did. And, and we did that for several for several weeks um, in, in the spring. And so nonprofits make up a big portion of what we do. The agency was founded on the idea of, you know, doing well to do good and uh, making great connections between our for-profit clients and our nonprofit clients. It lifts up the whole community. And Betsy Gamble, who founded the agency, and I are huge, long, civically engaged folks who who just have always reached into the community and always been the ones who raised our hands at the committee meetings to do more and more. So we love that work. It, it comes from the heart. Um, and we're doing a lot of it. And, and it's been good for us. I mean, it's been good for our business. Outside of that, so we do a little bit of consumer packaged goods. So those folks are doing great, right? Like people are buying Camellia Red Beans. And, and in fact, they've, their sales are up. You know, people want comfort food. They want community food. And couldn't happen to a better company because they're so civically minded. And so they've done some community goodwill. You know, that's what we work with them on, helping them shape their, their civic engagement and their cause marketing. And so they've been doing a lot of good things. And we'll continue to do that. So Camellia Beans uh, is one of our consumer packaged goods. We also work with the Riley companies um, on Louisiane and Blue Plate and um, French Market Coffee. Um, so all of them are doing great and we're doing good work with them. Um, so those are some examples of, you know, a few of the consumer packaged good uh, companies that we work with, a few others. Then we do professional services. So, you know, law firms, um, lawyers and help with their branding, help with their, uh, and, and you know, it's funny is with some of our law firm clients, we also help their clients. So for example, you know, we'll, we'll have an ongoing relationship where the law firm provides their legal needs and then we provide for their communications needs. 
sometimes that's in an issue situation or a crisis situation, but other times it's in like, there's a lot of innovation right now. Um, and so there's one law firm that we work with that represents a lot of startups and entrepreneurs. So we're helping them make launch announcements um, for FDA approval with COVID stuff uh, and those sort of things. So those are kind of fun and exciting projects because uh, you're telling people good news. We're coming to them with solutions for our pandemic. So that's been some good work. We have three or four of those that have, have arisen since the spring. So we're kind of all over the place. We've never been niche specific, but certainly in New Orleans, you can't have a thriving business in the sort of PR consulting world if you don't have a few restaurants and some hotels and and that sort of thing. And and we certainly had our share. I know that the nonprofits have been affected so much by people not being able to have fundraisers and do all these events and raise funds. So they've got their unique challenges. What are you seeing right now? What's what's the biggest challenge for all these nonprofits that you're dealing with and how are you helping them navigate and with their messages? I think fundamentally it's still about connecting with your stakeholders especially with nonprofits, to the extent we can help them to continue to communicate with their most loyal donors through direct communication like newsletters, social media, um, direct mail, all of those things are still very viable and nonprofits continue to need help with communications messaging. And their, their most loyal donors may, in fact, either keep their giving the same or increase based on the fact that giving makes you feel good. It makes, like, it makes you feel like you're having an impact in what otherwise is a very uncertain world. And so and there's been research that confirms that giving will stay the same or go up. There's been research that's come out that says giving will go down for a while because of the economy. Um, at the end of the day, what we have counseled our nonprofits to do is take it a step at a time. Don't make, you know, now is not the time to maybe pursue or start pursuing a large capital project necessarily. But it is a time to continue to m- communicate your message to your most loyal donors. Um, we also talk about how you need to communicate from the most inside to the general public. So make sure your employees have their right messages. Make sure board of directors are being good ambassadors for you. Uh, then you kind of get to your donor levels and then you know, and then worry about the general public. Like so many things, you know, yes, you'll find new donors right now, certainly, and that I don't ever want to dissuade a nonprofit from curtailing their communication program. But I think direct channels of communication right now, the priority versus big campaigns to external audiences. Right, that makes sense, yeah. And one thing I always think, and this is just based on <laughs> nothing, but you know, people ha- haven't been able to travel or people haven't been able to spend money in a myriad of ways, but doesn't that mean that people have money to give? Is that something that gets talked about and do people try and say, how do we, how do we tap into, <laughs> into that or am I crazy? No, 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 you're not crazy. We have absolutely talked about how spending has shifted, um, both for our for-profit and nonprofit clients. And so more takeout, less dine-in, less dry cleaning, more outdoor recreation, less salon services, more do-it-yourself projects. So um, at the end of the day, I think it's it's interesting. I don't know that we can make a prediction without some good economic research around, and there, there is some out there, around who has more money or not, right? Certainly people have lost their jobs. Many, many people have lost their jobs. And so we need to be thinking about that. We know also that the current extra unemployment will run out at the end of, or has run out now at the end of July. Um, and so we, we need to be conscious to meet people where they are. And we need to continue to remind them that they can make an impact um, with their dollars. And so uh, I think the development professionals in our space, which we're not, we're communications folks, but the development folks, the fundraisers out there, they're probably looking at each of their individual prospects, right? The bigger prospects and, and trying to learn where are you, right? And so if you were going to do a big gala at your house for us, can you just write that check you otherwise would have wrote to the caterer? Um, you know, but we're trying to make sure that each of those nonprofits we work with stay relevant and they continue to message to 
their need, right? Because it's all about their need. What do they need right now? And some of them have shifted their services um, to, you know, to meet the needs that are out there in the community. So, for example, and they're not a client, but I've just observed that the food banks here in New Orleans, you know, there's a huge infusion of cash coming through Feeding America, which is the national, you know, um, the national f- food uh, nonprofit in our country. But at the same time, the need has significantly increased. I mean, I would imagine our food banks are feeding four and five times as many people as they were before this started. And so, yes, cash infusion, but cash out probably too. And so um, that's just an example, I think, of how nonprofits um, are shifting just like retail businesses and corporations. Uh, We all have new expenses and we all have things we're saving money on. So it's hard to tell. And I'm not a big analytical financial guru, um, but I do think it's going to be interesting as studies come out and market research comes out on where the spending has shifted, who are the winners and who are the losers, because you're going to have both. We talked about nonprofits, but could I ask you about the food and beverage side for a minute and just those folks that you're working with, what types of messages are you helping them with? What types of crises are you helping them get through? And what's your just observations from that side of things right now? We work with Taste Buds, who owns Zia uh, Rotisserie, and they've been amazing through this whole thing. Um, they have been incredibly mindful of their employee safety throughout. So anytime they're making a decision, they're incredibly intentional about what they're asking their employees to do and whether it's safe and how they can keep them most safe. Um, and they come to us with that. So we're not telling them, oh, you know, message to your employees. They're saying to us, okay, when we roll this out, this decision or this announcement out, here's what we are most mindful of and here are the steps we've taken. So we've been incredibly impressed with them in that regard. But the, on the marketing side, what they've done and what we've helped them do is, um, is really get the word out about family meals. They've done a really nice job of packaging up their menu items for families and and getting the word out. And then now all of their restaurants have a drive, you know, a curbside pickup for for the family meals. I mean, you can order anything off the menu, but they're they're doing um they're doing great family packages and they're so affordable. Um so I'll brag on them for just a second cuz it's become one of my favorite meals. Um, with my Corona 15 that I'm battling, but yeah, me too, man. Huh? So they are doing red beans and fried chicken. Oh my God. It's $35. How much, how much stuff is it? Yeah. Oh my God. You get a whole container of these amazing, um, boneless fried chicken and it's dark meat and white meat. I think because it's so juicy. It is not like throw a boring chicken breasts in a fryer, you know, no, 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 no way. I mean, they've got to be marinated. I don't even know what they're doing. I probably should know as their marketer, but, um, it's incredible. And then the red beans are delicious. And we fed our family of four and then had leftovers the next day. And then they give you a gallon iced tea. Cause you know, we're in the South and everybody loves their iced tea. It's like 35 bucks. And you just call, You know, you order and you go by and you grab it and you come home and it's delicious. So they're doing a bunch of stuff. So anyway, so we're working with them. I just got really excited about fried chicken and red beans for a minute. Um, But they've been incredibly impressive. And so we're mostly using social media to get the word out. Um, And we're helping them with contests and promotions and influencers who can talk about them. And that work has been fun and good because they're good people um, and they're making good decisions, even when... Um, the city said, you can open, you know, they were, they said, should we open? And if we do, what do we need in place? And how do we communicate that? And so that's been great. And so we've loved working with them. We've continued to work with them. Um, and I think they're, they're doing okay. I mean, certainly not every restaurant's open and their tables are full, but they've really been able to shift um, to take advantage of the moment. Um, and so I like to brag about them because they've done the hard work. We've just communicated it. What's your thought about how a recovery is going to look and what type of work do you think you're going to be doing with all of your clients as we get through the rest of this year? I think that the whole, you know, and I've started to hear people say post-COVID 
we're nowhere near that. But the evolution of this thing is going to be a lot slower than anybody wants it to be. I think it's going to be an up and down curve. In other words, schools may reopen, but then the school down the street, somebody tests positive, and then they've got to shutter for however long they're supposed to shutter, and then we open again. Um, I think retail will go through different iterations of how it sells its stuff. Um, restaurants have certainly seen that already, you know, going, we kind of opened and then bars had to close. And so I think this is going to be bumpy. It's going to be slow. People are going to have to be flexible and nimble. We've never done this before. A lot of people talk about Katrina, but Katrina was different. There, we were talking about physical damage. We're talking about not the whole country, just a portion of the country. And so the other parts of the country were able to support us. The government was in a better position to support us here in Southeast Louisiana. Now the government has to support the whole country. The world is impacted. So, you know, we're gonna have to navigate this very carefully. What I hope doesn't happen is that the whole thing becomes just this politicized, you know, mess of decisions. I really, really hope that each individual takes responsibility to look at the science, to look at the health issue, and 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 talk about it outside of a frame of who they're going to vote for president or what the city leader should and shouldn't be. Because we're just getting distracted by that. I think everybody has to take personal responsibility to do good things in their business and in their life each day. Again, I said I'm a glass half full kind of person. I think that's where we start to create exponential impact. Everybody takes responsibility for themselves. You are the newly appointed leader of Gamble Communications. What's the right way to lead right now in these uncertain times? It's funny um, because taking the CEO role, I mean, I've been in leadership there at the company um, for several years now. Taking the CEO role, I think, adds... Uh, a lot more responsibility and a lot more pressure. And it's one of those, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. Um, and so, I, you know, my responsibility is to our team. Um, we are a professional services firm. The product we sell is our creativity, our craft as communicators, our thoughts and our thought leadership. And so each of us are the product and I have to, um, and I will, take responsibility for that product that we put on the table. We're highly proud um, and we hold ourselves to a very high level of service. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're I want to make sure as the leader, I am bringing out the best in our team members and giving them a space to succeed. Um, they've been incredibly grateful for uh, the flexibility of working from home. We've checked in with each other a lot. Um, and I think everybody's really invested in making our clients succeed, allow, you know, helping our clients succeed, I should say, um, and doing the best we can with the work we have. And then certainly, you know, Betsy, who founded our company, who is, you know, numero uno rainmaker of the universe, networker extraordinaire, uh, isn't going anywhere. And so she's, you know, out, we're working together, making sure that if there's a client out there that needs help and PR, that we're going to find them and we're going to help them. So, you know, we're trying to build our business at the same time, we're trying to help the clients we have. And, and that's our attitude. And I think it will come. So as the leader, I want to make sure that everybody is well taken care of and our team is in its best space. Last question. I, I know that a few years ago when you were at the YLC, you were a big part of getting those Wednesdays at the Square, uh, or maybe you were the whole reason the Wednesdays at the Square happened. And then also I know that now you are one of the creators of Beignet Fest. What's your thought for how festivals can adapt for the rest of this year, if at all, and then looking at 21? Um, first off, I don't want to take all the credit for YLC Wednesday at the Square. Uh, it was a true collaborative effort to go out and to take on, um, you know, it was a downtown development district project first, and we took it on and we were able to grow it. And it, it was quite a feat and, and quite a thrill to be able to do that. So don't want to take all that credit. There are a lot of brilliant, brilliant minds behind that. 
With Beignet Fest and with all the other festivals, um, you know, margins are already tight on festivals. You know, whether you're a fundraising festival like Beignet Fest that donates your proceeds and your profits to um, a charitable cause, or if you're a for-profit, you know, event producer, um, the margins are slim. And the way you build those margins are twofold. One is volume, um, volume of sales on site, and the other is corporate sponsorship. We know consumer demand might ebb and flow, but it's not going to go away. People want to go to music concerts. People want to go to festivals. We're known for that. People will continue to travel here for that in time. So that's, that part is, is going to be not as worrisome. To me, the worrisome part is the corporate sponsorship for events. Um, I think more and more corporations are going to pivot that money um, there's that word again, or reinvest that money that they were spending in live events and sponsorship of festivals, concerts, those sorts of things. And they're going to move it into another channel of marketing. And it's going to be real hard to get that back. So, you know, one of the reasons we did Beignet Fest at their place was not just to give our consumers um, a chance to do something and not just to continue to raise charitable dollars and not just to help our food vendors, but it was to keep our corporate sponsors engaged. Because if I can give them something to do activations through, it's gonna be that much easier to keep in touch with them, to keep them engaged, to keep them invested in this project um, next year. And, and we don't know that we'll have a festival next year either, right? I mean, that's not a given. Everybody's saying no Mardi Gras this year. It'll be interesting. Um, I probably, you know, at the end of the day, if I were hard pressed to make a prediction, I'd say the same thing. We're probably not going to have a Mardi Gras, at least as we know it. Um, and so, you know, Beignet Fest is usually in October. And so we have over a year to build, to refine, to keep corporate sponsors engaged, to find new ones. And it's going to be hard. But, you know, I think all the festival organizers and event producers, that's, that's all they can do is try to keep it alive. Um, I think some will stay around and others may, who are already struggling, um, because of those margins are are probably not going to be around, unfortunately. But this is a multi-year rebuild. We're not, you know, this is not a, in every, in 2021, everything's going to be better. Um, and it, and it's, man, it's a bummer because live music and what we experience as a community at a festival, even with our visitors who come from all over the world, that's hard to replace. Um, I'm an everyday jazz fester. We set up our 10 by 10 pop-up tent in our backyard in May and played WWOZ and, you know, went around and got food and did our thing, but it wasn't the same. You know, it's not the same as running into your grade school friend who you haven't seen or somebody from San Francisco striking up a conference conversation in the, in the uh, crawfish beignet line or whatever. I mean, those are things that we can't replicate at home. And, uh, and so hopefully the desire for that and the investment in that won't go away. Um, and we'll, we'll figure out a way to save it. Well, I sure hope so. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk. That was a especially educational conversation, so thank you. Well, you're welcome, and it's nice to visit with you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biz Talks. If you like what you hear each week, don't forget to rate us and leave a comment wherever you listen to your podcasts. And follow us on social media at Biz New Orleans. For more information or to contact us, please visit bizneworleans.com slash biztalks.